Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the February installment of 100 Pictures of Honey, a first for us, a reading slash interview with two amazing writers, Lauren Camp and Nadia Arioli. And the title of today's um, presentation or reading is called The Lion in the Dream. Um, I gave it that name for two reasons. Um, one, because a poem is both of those, right? It's a lineated object and it's a, a, a realm of possibility. Right. But also because uh, these two readers today, their books are focused on two artists. Uh, and uh, the, I think those two words represent those artists pretty well. Um, Lauren's book uh, is inspired um, partially by Agnes Martin, whose work is very minimalist and works a lot with the line and the grid. Um, and Natalie's uh, Nadia's book. Um, inspired by Kay Sage, who is a surrealist. Um, lit, so her paintings are all very much kind of within the realm of the dream. So I want to thank them both for being here. Um, I'm so excited. I think what we're going to do is have each uh, of them read a poem to start us off. That would be a wonderful way to begin. And then hopefully the conversation will uh, will kind of evolve naturally um, as we go through uh and we'll hear some more poems um, within the course of that. I will be dropping their kind of official long form bios into the chat so that you can learn more about them. Um, and hopefully uh, you will be very excited to um, get their books once they are in the world. Lauren, would you mind starting us off with a poem from your book, An Eye in Each Square? Oh, I'd be glad to. Donna, thank you for the invitation to be here in conversation with Nadia talking about art, one of my favorite topics. So I'm going to read a poem that I haven't, I don't think I've read to an audience. It's called Lecture on Nothing. And it is, the title comes from a John Cage uh, performance from the late 1940s, but then it has nothing to do with John Cage after that particularly. Lecture on Nothing. Again, I spend three days in the antique gaze of Agnes's eyes and her buttoned up dressing of silence to expose the episodic echo of everything she ever knew. If she were pronouncing one thing, it seemed to enlarge. I take a break and slice a loaf and watch for longing. The kitchen is in constant muss, and we eat all the parts that have been left for us. The prayer of coastline, loosed mosses. I've never been older. I am content to let the people around me explain the proportions of their shadows. Today's rain knocked slow on the roof early morning. A perfect monotony, a change of measure. I notice Agnes sits and frames the room, and the room where she sits is built reliable around her. There is always the tangible sun, continuous, and her body never chummy. I am close to her thick tufts of hair. Her eyes fill with seawater, her face in its later pieces, looking at empathy. Something is happening. She is looking out through her own set of rules. Gray passes to each window of my small cottage, unfastened. Tracks vanish. Yesterday, I spent hours walking through restless grasses. Mud edge gradually spread, and I would not reverse. The humid air and the stalks and pods as crickets piled on top of each other. I don't believe there is nothing. I believe in that stare in slanted sunlight, whatever she spotted. It is late. The sky has gone on to sleeping. Night is my chaste memory. I won't tell you I understood, only that this is what I wanted to open, the coast, the clouds. Everything is capable of a once upon a time and I wanted to see it, to hold the world to its grain, what was missing. 
Beautiful, Lauren. Thank you. Wonderful way to start. And now we're going to hear a poem from Nadia in her book, Be Still. Let me, I'm in the chat, I'm going to just drop the, the link um, to the painting, just so you can look. I mean, you don't have to, because I think it stands on its own, but there it is. So then, go... Yeah. I saw three on I saw three cities by K Sage. Neither living nor dead, I saw three cities, all without blood. I too am bloodless, without heart or motion. John or Nike, I stand in the gray green of a storm that never comes. In one of the cities, I saw a death, a gun as lidless as I am wrapped in a woman's stiff hand, a bullet folded through the fat of her heart, as if she too were pole and cloth. I will not tell you what I saw in the other two cities. Not the land of the dead, but its twin. This is the place where grief goes static, not the violence, but the dissociation after. A land where no shadows move. But see how my robe or shroud is caught up in a wind that must have blown. See how I grew shoulders almost to bury my lack of head so it can sob without a mouth. Are still things really still? Thank you so much, Nadia. Um, I, I, I love that poem is one of the ones that I marked to maybe talk about because um, it starts uh, with with a, a larger vision and ends in almost the purest version of ekphrasis where you're describing um, the painting, which is usually the opposite of how poets work when they're writing about specific paintings. So it's also the perfect segue into kind of my first question for the two of you, um, which is, you know, what was it about this particular artist, their work, their life that um, inspired you to start writing poems and then not only write one poem based on one painting, um, but to continue to consider this artist over and over again, um, enough so that it built a collection of poems. Um, I guess someone has to go first. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess like it was part, there were several things. Um, so her paintings are really compelling to me. Um, they're just, I don't know, they're really stark, they're really precise, and there's enough there that you can describe it in interesting ways, but there's enough not there that you can interpret it how you want. Uh, another thing is no one knows who Kay Sage is, right? If you go <laughs> to a used bookstore, you can get eight books on Picasso, nine on Van Gogh, but there's going to be nothing on Kay Sage. No one knows who she is. Um, she, and that just seemed unjust to me. And I wanted people to know about this painter. So I decided to write a book. That's great. I, I think um, Agnes Martin is uh, a little more knowable and also not very knowable either because she chose to be enigmatic in all of her, uh, in, uh, in all of her presentations to the public. Um, I picked Agnes Martin. I had known of her work for a long time. She lived in New Mexico, where I live, uh, for the second half of her life. And I had seen her, her paintings. There's a permanent exhibit in Taos about an hour and a half north of here. And I had been in that, that gallery many times, sat with her work, none of which had me writing about it. I wrote one poem 20 years ago. And um, other than that, I never touched it again, but I would go look at her work when I saw it. And I started, the, the thing that changed was, it was 2017, we had a new administration. Things were chaotic. I mean, whatever side you were on politically, if any, the country was in chaos. And then on top of that, my family was in a, a very more, a much more intimate chaos. My father was plummeting into dementia, into Alzheimer's. And suddenly I needed that, those spare 
quiet, open canvases. I didn't know why. I didn't really think about it. I just knew I wanted to stay in them, that there was something there that that eased all the other stuff. And actually, the first poem in the book sets this up. It was a poem I wrote later, but that idea that I'm going, I'm going away with a biography about this enigmatic painter and a month away, and I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I'm going to keep looking. I think that that's interesting in, in both of your answers. And Nadia used the phrase that she was intrigued by both what's there and what's not there. And then Lauren saying that I knew there was something there, but I didn't know what it was, um, is a really interesting thing to hear you both say. It wasn't like you were, you, you know, wrote, woke up one day and said, I'm going to write a book about and <laughs> just kind of started going. Um, but that there were things that you were discovering by looking at this artist's work, by learning about this artist's work and the artist. And the thing I find so interesting about your books is that um, I think that that Lauren, your book has us a, a spareness or a use of the line that I think mimics that kind of quiet space of Martin's work. Um, and Nadia, your poems have this kind of richness of image that puts us often in a place of um, disorientation or feeling that surreal kind of quality of life um, that K Sage's paintings do. And I'm wondering, um, once you found yourself kind of entrenched in, in writing and being inspired by these women, um, how much, you know, like research were you doing? Like, were you spending more time with biography or with viewing the paintings? Uh, I'll go first. I I spent um, very little time. I made, I sort of made a decision aside from this, what to my memory, I, I own the book, but to my memory, what was like kind of an enormous biography uh, written by Nancy Prinsenthal. Um, and I read that, that was the full extent of the research I really wanted to do. I wanted to be in conversation with her paintings and my and my experience of her paintings, not her person. And so for me, the research was not like Agnes Martin wrote. She she there there's a there are a lot of writings. People kept sending them to me. I didn't want any of them. I didn't want her voice in my head. I I wanted, I mean, I watched a couple of interviews, but mostly I just wanted to stand in front of her paintings or look online if I couldn't stand in front of them and say, what is it about this that I see, that I need, that I feel? So in this case, it was a really active decision to step away from research, which normally I love, but I didn't want it here. Interesting. Again, that what's there and what's not there, like what we want, what we need and what we don't need. Nadia, what about you? Well, mine had like really good timing. So I did some research online. There's not a lot. There really isn't. And then once I wrote like 20-ish mm, poems is when, so I want to say like in 2020, maybe 2021 is when the biography dropped and by Stephen Robeson Miller and it has every single thing she's ever painted. And so I spent more money on the book than I've ever spent on a book. <laughs> and I just I just went through it. So I would say I did a, a good amount of research. Um, but that's tempered by the fact that there isn't a lot to research because there's just like not a lot of information on her. Um, because I just wanted to weave different things in like I wanted to weave things about her life my life the paintings and just have a variety in my writing I've been accused of beating a dead horse because I just get very obsessed and repetitive and so I just wanted to make sure I didn't do that a of all so that's why I researched her <laughs> and then b of all I also just like didn't want to show up ignorant you know I didn't want to be writing about I don't know, K-Sage's children when she didn't have kids or just like make a, a stupid error. <laughs> and I, you know, so it's interesting because we, there, there's a, 
there's a connection here that it seemed like both of you were exploring. Um, and for Nadia, it sounds like the research was more of a, there isn't a lot about her. Let me see how much I can find out about her because she intrigues me. And for Lauren, it was, I just want to sit with the, with the work and not have too many other things invade. Um, I want to talk to you a little, uh, both about kind of this idea of um, where the, the art does kind of come into the poems. There are several places in your books where that occurs. I think Nadia's, uh, her titles are all after paintings, if I'm correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Um, but Lauren, you have so many small places in, in your poems that are also deeply personal that kind of hint at or reference the work of Martin. We have, you know, I, um, I just marked some lines um, from Trusting Space at the end that she has drawn hurt, a line erased many times. And we have... Uh, we mention in protection, thin paper edged with lack and brink, um, kind of that pushing of, and then in your poem, Reason Out, which is about your dad, the way the lines are arranged almost looks like a grid, which was very often an aspect of Martin's work. Um, and in Nadia's book, you, you really um, push the definition of kind of ekphrastics in a really interesting way. You have at least two um, long, they're a little bit more like lyric essays, I think, in the book that are really structured um, in a way that's fascinating to me because they start with the personal and then they mention something specific, very specifically about the artist and then they go back and forth kind of like a braid. Um, so I was wondering if you could each maybe talk a little bit about how how often you felt the art directly referenced in your poems and whether or not that was as significant as the feeling that you wanted to convey. I don't know if I asked that correctly, but. For me, it was, oh, sorry. For me, it's the latter. I was just kind of going for mood for a couple of reasons is this book ended up being a chunk <laughs> it was 140 pages so we wanted some variety in there <laughs> and <laughs> then also I kind of wanted the poems to be read as separately if you didn't feel like googling the paintings so I just kind of went for like tone and mood it'd be great if you could find all the paintings and the more people knowing about Case Age the better but if you don't I feel like there's enough going on and enough there that if you don't have the paintings, it's it's gonna be okay. I think that for me, it wasn't even the whole painting. I was, I was sort of referencing. It was, it was that individual line going. You know, Agnes Martin used a hor horizontal line was the main element she used, even if she was creating grids. And um, and it usually was pencil or it was typically pencil. It was very light. And I was after that line the, and the space above it and the space below it. Uh, and maybe sometimes really what I wanted was the space. I wanted all the things in the world to just recede. And I I couldn't find it in my life. And so I kept going back to the paintings and investigating that. So I had, uh, I, I appreciate Donna that you said that it's it's spare. I, I don't know if that's the word you used, but the manuscript and the poems, I think I wrote double the number of poems. I wrote a lot of poems abstractly to this character of the line. I got very into like this almost odd altered space of, of thinking of the line as the not person but the thing I was writing to and about and it became so important and so maybe soothing even that I just kept writing into that and that's an abstract very abstract place to be writing into and so a lot of those poems got shuttled off to the side 
or um, or I I started to put some kind of grounding in there so that they wouldn't be like, you know, you didn't have to look at the the painting, you didn't have to know, but if you didn't look at the painting and you didn't know, those poems were really really abstract. Thank you for that. Um, I, I'm going to ask. I'm going to do a little request of each of you in just a minute, because I think one of the things that I loved about both of your books, even though they're so very different, is is the there the artist is there, right? This, the you know these are ekphrastic, but um, there it's not the the only thing. These aren't pure just descriptions of pieces of art, which is sometimes how people view that kind of work. Um, you both expand on images so well and in such interesting ways that I'm wondering if I could uh, make a couple of requests for, for poems here in the middle. Um, Lauren, could you read Protection? Yeah. Um, give me a minute. I think it has a lot about what you were just talking about in it. Sure, I'm glad to. Protection. On the path, flexible droplets, rib, moss, and branches, clutch any libation. This, then, is what I fix to, this hillside. My goal is to dress each day with the inside of ours and the next shallow moment. Her thin paper edged with lack and brink, the shaky lead coming along without argument every direction. I feel that to be quiet is to hear the size of a conversation between lazy grasses. I keep looking at a chair in the meadow, and now what I've learned is the view drains back to featureless, and I am calm as she'd ever managed to be. What if my work is to let the mind take to the winnow and linger? Squirrels zipper to upper branches. I notice the sky to be edgeless. This is all so simple. My eye to the coffee cup on the counter that holds a slight daisy turning outward. Thank you. I and mean, we have that featureless view there and that calm. Um, and even the action of the squirrel being aligned, the way it zippers to upper branches when we think of squirrels usually as scurrying. Um, and Nadia, if you have it on hand, would you mind reading uh, on all surroundings are referred to high water? Oh, sure. Um, oh, I opened to that page. Look at that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. So on all surroundings are referred to high water by Kay Sage. I know now that lobsters are not immortal, but instead shed their exoskeletons when their flesh bumps against it, like a toddler taking off too tight clothes. Each undressing takes more time and energy as the lobster grows. And because lobsters never stop growing, they die sometimes mid eclosion of exhaustion. I see myself as cathedral getting knocked down and rebuilt, each clearing of debris more laborious than the last. I have to be careful when I go, when I bump against supporting walls. You told me you collect suicides because even that doesn't guarantee immortality. I wondered if you meant a scrapbook, little things you made and found, turned sea creature with all the glue, a two page spread with punch outs for Elliot Smith, globs of glitter for Marilyn, little construction paper waves for for heart crane when all for when all surroundings were referred to high water i don't think you meant to be mawkish you would eat the suicide's transgressions if you could but instead you must store them another way as late as 1906 villagers still had sin eaters wretches paid to ease the suffering of the dead at the wake a loved one would place a morsel of food on the departed's chest to absorb their sins, like sins were sauce or brine. After waiting a few minutes, an hour, the outcasts would eat, each soul's made passing, 
Each soul's passing made lighter by not having to carry what no longer fit them. Then the sin eater became an outcast, forced to live outside the village, dreaded like an ominous building that must now and then be visited. I know now that I am not immortal. I've known that for a long time. When I go, however I go, place a blue lobster on my chest. Thank you so much for that. It's one of my favorites in the book. Um, Thank you. And I think that what I love what you what you do here and in so many poems in the book is you start with a fact or an image that is outside of, of the painting. Um, and then you expand on that image. We go from lobster to cathedral, right? To, to suicides, to sin eaters, but somehow it all comes back together with the lobsters um, at the end. And, and you do that, I think, masterfully in, in many poems throughout the book. And I think it, it's a great form um, to mimic a surrealist, right? Because um, in surrealist, when you're looking at a surrealist painting, your mind is often going from one part to another and thinking maybe this, maybe that, what if this, what if that, maybe this, you know, and looking at kind of the, the contradictions. So thank you both for inserting those. I thought they they went well with, with what you were saying um, about your poems. Um, I was wondering if either one of you has a background in art or creates art and and if if so did this influence uh your writing in any way or is it just kind of a happy coincidence if that's so I don't have a background in art at all <laughs> not even a little bit um I took maybe two classes in high school and that's it um, I do create art, but it's very different than Case Sage. Case Sage is all about like precision. Um, that's what makes her painting so interesting. Um, uh, whereas mine tends to be a slapdash mess. <laughs> um, I do have a background in art. Well, I mean, I have a background as an artist. I don't have a background in studying art per se. I spent, before I came to poetry, I spent about 12 years as a professional visual artist. My medium was fabric uh, and thread, fiber, and I made a lot of work um, and I didn't really know what I was doing, uh, which has turned out to be very useful, a very useful approach for me in all ways. It's, it's kind of how I work. I don't like to learn except by trial and error. And while I'm in that, I don't much love that, but still that's that's the way that I work best is to experiment, to try things without knowing that someone else has done them before. So, uh, so when I sort of switched over, I was gonna say transitioned, but for a while there was, I was doing, I was kind of doing both, um, not super well. And then, um, and I was working poetic lines into, into my art, um, into the art titles, artwork titles. And then I switched over and took with me into poetry everything that mattered about visual art. Uh, composition, negative space, pattern, color, texture, uh, all of that, how, how I was going to um, use any of those in a poem might only be obvious to me, but all of those things continue to to be very important to my poems. The same time that I was making visual art, I was also uh, hosting a, a music show on our public radio station. And so sonics and segues also matter to me. And again, in both of those, I think there's silence and um, silence and sound or absence and presence and that I think is pretty obvious throughout an I and H square. That's interesting. Um, I uh, I knew that I knew that Nadia made art, and I I thought I remembered that you had made art, but I didn't know you were a fiber artist, um, which is really interesting to to find out. Um, is there is there if you 
you know, I know that both of you, I mean, especially Nadia, you want some awareness of this artist out in the world. And that was one of the reasons that you became um, interested in learning about them. But do you feel like there is an over, like a vision that you had for your book, like something that you wanted readers to to take away from it other than maybe the desire to, you know, learn a little bit more about these artists. Is there, was there another kind of, as you wrote, um, kind of theme or purpose that emerged? I think Lauren, you talked a little bit maybe about that um, at the beginning of our conversation, but I'm just going to kind of rephrase to see if there's something else that we have to add to that. You go first, Lauren. I'm tired of always going first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking. I, I think there's been a lot of attention very recently on Agnes Martin. I wouldn't say that I was doing this to, to raise any awareness of her. I think she. Um, I I don't I don't know why exactly, but at the moment I'm just thinking about how she would joke about how her paintings sold two for a million, meaning she had a following. She had, she, there was a lot of attention to her work among certain art circles. I was writing for me. I was writing to find some kind of peace. I wasn't writing a book. I was just writing, writing, writing. I, I really appreciated what Nadia said about um so I don't know how, how you said it, but about a sort of overdoing, about writing a lot. I wrote a lot. I wrote, I wrote just like because the the only place there was spaciousness in my life at that moment was on the page. And so I kept writing onto the page draft after draft. And it didn't matter if they were good or right, they were just settling. Well, I think. So the purpose, like we talked about a little bit, was kind of poems for K-Sage, but then like some other things merged mid-project. Um, so it ended up kind of being about depression. She did end her life uh, with a gun. This is what I was referencing a little bit. So I wanted to write a little bit about just like depression in her life in general, just mental health awareness. And then another thing that emerged so weirdly was that time travel is possible. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know this, but it kind of just like turned into a, like a weird sci-fi concept. I don't know why it wasn't planned. It just happened. So it was the idea that like, okay, K-Sage lived, she died, um, but her paintings kind of go on and on and on. And then once someone died, especially if it's sort of like abrupt or traumatic, you kind of have to go back and revisit their life. So if you know someone that whose life ended in a particular way or in like in violence, then you kind of go back and like re-examine your interactions with them or what their life really was. And so I just, it just kind of ended up being time isn't linear. And I think there's, there's, there's a place in, in one of your lyric essays, the Starling's Caravans um, essay, where um, I think you have, you have a line that I think in kind of encapsulates what you just said, where um, in part of this, it says, it seems inevitable that Case Age shot herself in the chest, doesn't it? I mean, Look at her paintings. All are the moment before the gun goes off and the moment after. That's how you know there isn't a way out. Um, and I think that you do that that kind of time travel, as you call it, that bouncing back and forth between things that happen to her in her life and things that are personal and things that are kind of cultural of kind of blending those together really well. I think this is a good place now for you each to read another poem before <laughs> I ask a, a final question and then see if there are any questions from our audience. So um, poet's choice, right? Who would like to go first? I'll go first, but I, um, I wanted to say a little something about, and I think you asked this question and I didn't answer, but about how, um, the the paintings or Ag Agnes's decisions in her paintings influenced 
what I did in the poems, or maybe this is just a question to myself that I'm doing here for everybody, because I, because the material that I had, the subject that I had was different from other things I might write. I, the poems were different and the way they looked on the page was different. I mean, I don't think that by nature, I have an easy time writing very spare poems, but I had no way to make maximalist poems out of this material. I didn't want to, it didn't seem right. So that was particularly interesting to me to sort of see how I was trying to not make a replica of her, of her paintings, not, not even necessarily reference a particular painting, but in some way reflect the experience of the work on, on my page. Anyway, um, so I'm gonna read, um, I think I'm gonna read one of the very, very, very short poems in the book. Having just said that, there are three of them. I was very determined to have these in here. Uh, and they are they they are basically two lines long. One of them is two and a little bit, intending to sort of show the um, the spaciousness of her paintings. And also, I I want to make a call out to my publishers, both of whom are here, because they helped me show show her paintings and sort of showcase what I wanted in the book graphically and. So anyway, this poem is called Lineage. Thank you also to the white on white continuing persistent. And is the artist telling me to see how familiar this is and what's in it? For that. And since m many of the poems in the book reference your father, there is a, there's an echo of, of lineage in in there too, the, what's familiar and what isn't, um, especially with the disease that your father suffered from. Um, Nadia? Okay, I'm going to read A, a Bird in the Room. Um, so this one talks about time travel because um, the future caused the past. I won't, you'll just, <laughs> I won't get into it because that's really boring, but just, just trust me on that. And then also, a fact about Case Age is she was married to a much more famous surrealist, uh, Ives Tangi. And the, pro the problem there was that she got the Frida Kahlo treatment, which was basically, oh, the cute little wife paints. That's so cute. She has a hobby. But he, he um, the poem makes reference of this. He did die suddenly of an aneurysm. So it was just like just complicated things about her life and her marriage and what it means to be an artist married to an artist. So here we go. On A Bird in the Room by Kay Sage. The year after you died, I refused all fruit. I could not bear that hybrid of plant and ghost. By the time a lemon reaches the east coast, its tree could be in flames. All that's left a sour ball, a seed unwelcomed on chicken. The month you died, I kept the fruit I found on walks in shadows. If I can't have it, no one will. I stuck them in my rafters, where darkness transformed them. Not castration, but refuse. The week you died, I examined pits. Nectarines, apricots, peaches, all malformed brains. I had wondered about mangoes. Under sunset skin, thick orange slime. What keeps the roundness? Can you read Braille? The day you died, there was a bird in the room, round and pulsing. A bird is a kind of fruit. You can take it apart with your hands. I think it was looking for a tree filled with pomegranates or twigs. I know what the old women say. If a bird enters your home, a member of your household will die. I did not know they meant the spot where all gentleness gathers, the pit. You have to wonder the causality and how far back it will go. The year I refused fruit made me still inside. The stillness filled our house with gray. The pits fell out of rotting bodies. 
the bird got lost somehow and invited itself in. I think it killed you, love, killed you with feathers and legs. How perverse that you will never go into the ground, never go to tree. You'll fly, little bird, out over the co coast, but I'll leave my door open for you in case you get lost. For you, love, I will fill my home with ash. Oh, I wanted to mention real quick that it was a, a case of truth being stranger than fiction. So the day before Ives died, a bird got in their house. And according to superstition, that means someone's going to die. And that actually happened, which is crazy. Uh, I, like, I love the all the turns um, and the different ways that you use the fruit and the pits in that poem. Um, the the reference that the very subtle reference to the aneurysm of the the pits as malformed little brains, um, really really rich work. Um, so we're we're getting to about three forty. So um, I will say to anyone that's here in the audience, if you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat, and I will be happy to to share it with our readers. But I am going to ask you a little bit about um, kind of what what's 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 next for you what's what's coming or what are you working on do you have new kind of obsessions um and then i'll go to some of the questions in the chat um sometimes uh, after you write a book that's very heavily you know kind of focused um you have a tendency to not want to do that again so i was just curious if you have new obsessions or new kind of um things that are happening that that are um not necessarily art related, but kind of focused on on a similar theme or topic. Hey, Nadia, well, you first. Uh, okay, <laughs> after I had the Case Sage book uh, written, um, I wrote a little chat book about television. So it is kind of a crisis again, but this time it's essays. That should be coming out in a month or so through Dancing Girl Press. They got behind, which is fine. It's no big deal, but that should be coming out. So that's a singular focus. And then in 2025, I have a book coming out uh, from Fern Fernwood about motherhood, but it's just different things about that. Like the first part, it's really literal. I gave birth, hooray. <laughs> and then the second part is about Grendel's mother. And then the third part is an essay about hair falling out. Because um, one of my relatives got al alopecia at the same time that I got postpartum hair loss. So we're both going through like this really odd, like kind of distressing thing. I've, I've seen a couple of those Grendel's mother's poems. So I'm excited to, to see what the book Thank is you. like. <clears throat> That's a lot. It's a lot of projects. I... Um... Yeah, I I turned away from art writing about art. I hadn't really thought about that, but um, until you asked that question, actually, I looked. I think most of what I've written has been looking into deep space and darkness, um, and so so going from looking above and below the line into kind of potentially nothingness or or great distance. Uh, all of that work started because I spent a month at the Grand Canyon and I was there with the responsibility, the the pleasure and responsibility of uh, writing about the darkness, the stars, the skies over the Grand Canyon. And so, yeah, I wrote a lot about that. That's both interesting topics. We have a question from the chat from Nancy. Um, says, Lauren, you had told me about the influence on your poetry of being a fabric and visual artist, but I didn't know about the music influence as a radio host. Could you talk about music influence on your poetry a bit, please? Sure. Um, my programs, I had two programs that I did for Santa Fe Public Radio, and they were both, the first was uh, a jazz program specifically, and the second was jazz and world music. In both cases, I interjected poetry because because I wanted to hear it in there, and um, it wasn't my it wasn't ever my poems. I would read three contemporary poems that I had selected over the course of the week, 
by three different people uh, interspersed between music. So I was mixing particular tracks of music and looking for intriguing segues. But then I was also looking for how to come, what music to sort of create a, a landscape around particular poems. Um, so in both cases, I was looking to mix words and sound, sound and less sound or different sounds, uh, different genres. And then I think maybe the, the real conversation is about jazz and what jazz taught me for, for my poetry, which is both to create something recognizable, something with some kind of perhaps pattern and also places of improvisation and places that kind of go off the rails a little bit that, that are not what you expect. And that's definitely something I'm looking for in my poems. Great question. Thanks, Nancy. Another question that we have, and maybe Nadia can start with this one is, um, do you find the process of, oh, this is from Lynn, do you find the process of writing a series of ekphrastic poems different from writing a series of poems inspired by something else like hurricanes, shipwrecks, or baseball? Or is the process similar? I'm thinking particularly about how writing poetry that's not directly inspired by autobiography involves different ways of interacting with the world. So is is, it fras is, is writing poems that start from ekphrasis different from writing other maybe thematic poems is the question, I think. Oh, okay. Um, I would say... Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, it it is different because you have to be looking at a painting and engaging it with something or to some degree. But like, I guess it's not too, too different for me specifically because I like to have a lot of like structures and rules around projects. And so I, none of my books are, well, actually one of them is, but besides that, <laughs> most of my books are not just like collections of poems there's nothing wrong with that at all I love books that are just collections of poems I just know I do better if I have like a theme a constraint something like that and so yes this one was ek so it was very literally constrained by paintings but my other work often is um you know like these are the poems about Grendel's mother and these are the poems about billboards and these are all animal poems. So I, I just do better with structure. So it wasn't super different. I kind of agree with Nadia that it's not an easy question to answer. It's not a yes or no um, for me. The process is not quite different. It's a little different. It's, um, it has some, it has it has some scaffolding, I guess. I guess that's what I would say. It has some sense of either what I'm circling around. It's not like uh, it's not like I'm just going out walking down my road and saying, "Oh, what can I see here that I can start a poem with?" Which I don't actually write that way anyway. But but it's starting with something that I want to investigate and maybe something that I want to communicate too. So it has, like in the way that I was talking about the Grand Canyon astronomy poems, I had an audience for that, a specific audience, which was people who don't get dark skies, don't get to see them, don't get to know what that experience is like. I like having a project where there's something, um, even though I'm not really thinking about an audience, where there's something that I'm trying to hold for someone else. I'm not really sure if I'm if if this is making sense because I think it's a it's it's not a tight constraint. It's just a little bit of a oh yeah, I I want to get Agnes in here or I want to whatever it is I'm covering um that I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to make sure it's in there and that's different from just opening up to anything. Wonderful. Um, we have another question in the chat from Alejandro. Um, in thinking about maximalist versus minimalist poetry or writing, um, he's wondering how does one play with maximalist visually on a page in a way that's impactful? Do you notice if there's a difference in how you visually format if you're trying to do one versus the other? 
I know that Lauren kind of mentioned, I'll see if I can maybe hold her up. Like this is the poem lineage that she read. So it, even though it's two lines, it could have been at the top of the page, but it's not. It has all this space kind of around it. Um, and there's the other one that I talked about, which the way it's lineated almost ends up looking like a table or a grid or kind of an offset of long lines. Whereas in Nadia's book with the lyric essays, we have these kind of separated chunks of more prose looking work. And um, the poems tend to be longer. Many of them are, are more than a page, even though there are some shorter poems in the book. Um, so, I mean, I, I'll just, I shared that as kind of a, to give you guys a moment to think about if there is an actual answer to that question that you would like to share. So um, is there a difference in how you visually format your work if you're trying to give maybe a, a sparer impression or a fuller impression? Heck yeah. I, I mean, absolutely. I I had a lot of fun thinking about how I was going to, how I was going to use the lines that I had written or write, write the, po write the lines sometimes so that it expressed what I felt from the paintings. Everything, everything that I did formatting wise in this book um, was really very new to me. It was very specific. It was like an overlay or an underpainting to to the words I was writing. It it's not like oh these are these are formatting styles that I use all the time and I was just going to apply them. They went specifically to uh, to to these poems and to Agnes's aesthetic and to my desperate need for that aesthetic uh, while I was writing them, and I I'm finding that that maximalist minimalist or subject and um shape uh structure is different project to project and i'm i think now that i've written a lot i think i'm really looking for ways that i can further the words by structuring in ways that like that's just another another revision approach for me is just what do I want this to look like and what fits? And I don't always know for a while. Such a big question that I'm not like, not even sure how to answer. Like, do my poems take shape with, the, with a specific intention or not? I think the answer to that is yes. <laughs> like it's kind of both, but I think I kind of thought about thought about two things a lot so number one is her case age's paintings because they move without moving like it's called the book is called be still because the paintings are so still but like I said in the first poem I read are still things really still are they are you sure are you sure and then the other thing was I read a lot of comic books and one of the things that's really cool about comic books is that you can decide the speed at which it goes. So if you're watching a TV show, you don't control how fast the action is, right? That's it's just whatever the film is. But with a comic book, you can decide how fast the action takes place. And so I was trying to do that a little bit with my poems is kind of have the reader control the speed because a short line will go um, will go slow and a lot, long line will actually go really fast. And so I was just trying to, I guess, mimic moving without moving with that. I hope that makes sense. I don't oh, know. Yes, I like and love these answers. Um, and then there's one more question that I will uh, ask from the chat and then I'll, I'll ask you each then to close this off maybe with one more poem. Um, Han asked, I'd love to hear something about the ethics of writing ekphrasis, do you have one that you're aware of? Or are there aspects of an art that you might turn particularly towards or one that you might avoid in your engagement with work? There were things, there were things about Agnes Martin that I knew, I, I knew a lot about her as it turned out, but there were things that I didn't want to overtly reference in the poems. I didn't want to take them on. I didn't want to make them 
the story that I was telling, she, um, you know, she had, she dealt with mental illness. She was, uh, I think, uh, basically a, she was a lesbian, I think basically a closet lesbian at the time. Um, I didn't really want to deal with those things. They're referenced. If you know about it, you can find them in the poems, but I didn't want to make it be about, um, I, I, about those things. I, so I think in a way that was, that was maybe something I was almost avoiding. Um, I, I do feel like for me, I'm not trying to replicate an artwork. I've written a lot of ekphrastic poems uh, about a lot of different, mostly modern artists, contemporary artists. Um, I think when I moved away from from actually making visual art, I really still wanted my hands in it in a way. And so I would bring to each poem that I wrote a sense of why do I care about this work? Or why do I think the artist made it out of this medium or this way? So that was how I, I, I think that's, I think that's sort of how I ethically approach an artwork, not I'm going to tell you about the artwork, but I'm going to tell you about my engagement with it or my curiosity of it. I guess uh, for ethically for me is I never wanted to pretend that I was the same person as Kay Sage. So I can speak about her. I can even write poems in the first person as her, but I just want to make it clear that I am not like her mouthpiece. You know, I don't get to decide if she's a good person or a bad person. I don't get to decide if some of her more controversial actions were good or bad because I'm not the arbiter of Kay Sage as a person. Um, so that was important to me. And then for talking about her life, um, there were, well, like I didn't want to say how, I don't know. I just, I just tried to be clear in the footnotes, <laughs> even if I wasn't in the poem. Um, so in the poem, I made it so it seems like she really loved her husband and I think that's true I think she did but in the footnotes I like make it clear that hey actually there's a little bit of ambiguity around this based on what her friend said and just just sort of separate fact and fiction or fact and speculation and my life just have them be three separate things no and I think I think you both do that very well in your books where if you know about the person, you can see those echoes in the poems. So for instance, in Nadia's book, I did not know a lot about Case Age. So I didn't read the notes and the footnotes until after I read the poems. And then when I went back and read the poems again, I could I could pick up on these pieces of, of biography that were included in the notes. But I don't think, I think what, I, what both of you did was use the artist's work as reference for other things that ideas or concepts, whether that's mental health or the need for, for quiet or whatever those things were that you explored those topics um, without completely um, kind of, I think as Nadia said, you weren't, you weren't trying to be a mouthpiece for the artist. Um, what the artist created was the kind of emotional impulse for both of you to write these poems. Um, so before I ask you each, thank you so much for this conversation, it's been amazing. Um, but before I ask you both to, to end with one more poem, I'm just gonna do one more last little plug. Be Still, Poems for Kay Sage by Nadia is from Kelsey Books. Um, I thought I had the links ready to go, but I'll find them really fast. <laughs> and An Eye in Each Square from Lauren is from River River Books. Um, and I highly recommend both of them. So um, you guys can, you know, duke it out over who wants to, you know, read the last poem first. And I'm going to go look for those links so people can buy your books really quickly while you do that. I'm happy to go second simply because I don't know which one to read. I don't know if you have one. I had one ready to go, but it has the C word in it. So I think I'm going to fix it pick another one so if you want to if you want to go first Lauren okay I'll go first um I think since I've read pretty spare poems I think I will read a poem that I've 
avoided reading to audiences because it's pretty dense. Again, structurally, uh, I was thinking about that. It's a it's basically a box, a block of text. It starts with a quote from Agnes, uh, and the quote is, I just gradually learned to stop thinking. It doesn't help to try to shut it off forcefully. The poem is called, When the Line is Possible. How often she spoke for her work of silence with a wide gaze. How little she gave with her hermetic and constant impossible answers. And this was a revolution, a nest in the clouds. Where I am not, there will be vigils today. Yesterday, someone nearly fell. Someone fell. Someone stopped wearing hijab. Someone found emblems. Someone rages. Another city claims another person who needs a better question. My family believes I am overly sensitive. This is a fault of the imagination. Someone finds names to erase or to prove. Before this peninsula, I was constantly fatigued. It is morning, it is afternoon. I am sinking to worship the slipping of water, the hawks overhead. A vigil is not like the march that took place over the winter. The group moved with its variables and songs like a jagged vein and moved in its load, calm to the courthouse, which remained round and steady in the center of town. This estuary is built on an exact arrangement of roads. My husband sends a love note each morning and today's said he was blue. My father's gate is off. He cannot get up from his bed. The nation keeps straying and I'm in the wet and dry weeds, watching the water carry on, extending its dialogue both ways with land. Space here can be inward, omitting all light. Last night, the composer also staying here said he had learned in the small local church about the annual regatta. There were always boats on the river in Boston. That city for me was a tall house and a radius. Every view of the river proved it could be there, placid or angry or loose. It was easy to be a stranger, to be made of the streets, to be lush every evening with satisfactory attractions. In my other cities, it was easy to be a stranger, to make a name and a flower of life. I have been long in this room reading articles and interviews with Agnes and don't know who she was. Many people turned out for the march and I believe they will be there for the vigil and for the next lacerating discontent. There is an efficiency to a line which builds a network right or left, which promises and remembers again and has the chance to repeat. Agnes's blue is simple and watery with great potential. Agnes's line is not exact and not weak. You might see nothing, but it is a source considered, reporting opinions, significant. It is level. Thank you. And there was a lovely comment in the chat about um, how how nice both of your covers were. And I just want everyone to know that uh, Nadia actually painted her cover. Oh. <laughs> I used oil pastel, but yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, I wanted it to be like an homage to KSH. So I, I just like was inspired by some of the elements, but I didn't want it to be super duper precisely her because then I felt like that would invite a comment on my book, which was like, oh, this person thinks KSH is this way and they're just wrong. So I just kind of did like an homage. Um, so um, here we go, there's the painting. And then one thing I actually, yeah, Actually, we don't need to get into that. Just read the book. <laughs> so this one's called, uh, oh, this one's written in couplets. Um, just so you picture it. Um, just, it's two line stanzas each. On I Walk Without Echo by Kay Sage. To be a woman is to be caustic with no power. To instigate, but not to burn. A bellyless earthquake 
a doctor's bill that goes on and on. They say we were made second. Helpmate, companion, never the main story. A plot point in a chapter about blood. We go back, the feminine parts of ourselves, fetus Maritroshka dolls. My mother said I looked like one as a baby. I thought she meant I was one. I learned in an encyclopedia I was right. My mother was in utero with ova. An ovum became half of me. I still got most of my eggs. To be second, but half already there. And while carrying half of the next, feels like a mathematical anomaly, the kind that will fill a volume. I sat, holding up my dress, bent into three points. Head, knees, one between. Lips out like shellfish. I walk I want to walk without echo. I wait on a porcelain ear. I picture it, perfectly round O's of red. Such a bright color in the dark. I will it. I walk without echo. Bleed, damn you. Wow, thank you both so much for this conversation, for your beautiful books that I have read multiple times. Um, for indulging me because I haven't done this format before and I you were lovely people to begin with because I, I know both of you a little bit and and um, felt comfortable with you uh, as an interviewer. So thank you so much. Thank you to our audience for being here. Um, uh, the series this year is going in a little bit of a different direction instead of just a monthly reading. I'm going to be mixing up uh, four traditional readings a year with events that are more like this one. Uh, there'll be another interview in June with Jennifer Sutherland and Sarah Moore Wagner um, about their newest books uh, and the kind of themes of misogyny and gun violence that kind of weave through both of them in very different ways. Um, there might be a, a workshop, free workshop happening. We're trying some different things. So I'm so happy. I keep saying we, this royal we, it's me. <laughs> It's me. I'm a hundred pictures of honey. It's just me. Um, I'm so happy that you did this today. I'm going to stop the recording and thank you all for being here. And you can feel free to stick around and say thank you in the chat. Um, this has been wonderful and I am recording it. So if you know someone who missed it and would like to see it, um, they can find it later on the YouTube channel. All right. I'm going to stop the recording.